welcome to Clothes Horse, the podcast that really struggles with anti-hat dress codes. Seriously, why, why aren't we allowed to wear hats, multiple hats in excess at any time? <laughs> I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 165. Today, I'm joined by two fan favorites, Clothes Horse All-Star Maggie Green, a.k.a. the Halloween Queen, and Ruby Gertz, who I would say is also an all-star at this point. The last time I sat down for a conversation with both of them, we talked about gender and fashion, and it actually wasn't that long ago. Was that... April? I don't know. Time's going way too fast this year. I don't know about you. Anyway, this week's episode is part one of our conversation about dress codes and uniforms. We'll be talking about our own experiences with dress codes and uniforms, and Ruby will give us a history lesson on dress codes over the years. We'll also unpack both implicitly stated dress codes, as in things you might find in your school or employee handbook, And we're going to touch on implied sort of socially prescribed rules around dressing as well, which in many ways kind of function as dress codes, even though no one said, oh, like this is the rules. I mean, we talk about these unspoken rules a lot, right? Some of these rules, both actual written out versus, you know, just sort of telepathically communicated towards all of us, some of them will really surprise you. And others will be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. In fact, maybe what will be most surprising to you is how even if neither your job nor your school has had a strict dress code, you might find yourself following some dress codes that you didn't know about. I'm going to be really honest with you and tell you that we should have realized before we started recording that there was no way we would fit all of this into one episode. I mean, our document of notes and research was more than 13 pages long. That that was not going to fit into one episode. Um, but we're ambitious, right? So we tried. For the first time ever, this conversation about dress codes is split up across multiple recording sessions. So Often when you listen to a series about a topic with the same guest, we actually recorded that all in one sitting. And this time I'm not doing that. So today's conversation is from recording session one and recording session two, as I'm recording this right now, me talking, hasn't happened yet. It's actually happening tomorrow. So there is a chance that this could turn into a three-part series. I have no idea. The only way you'll know is by listening next week. If you contributed your thoughts for this topic, I put a big call out there on Instagram for for shared stories and experiences. Know that you will not hear them in this episode, but they will definitely be in the next episode next week. Today's conversation is really long, so I'm not doing much of an intro-outro segment, which is kind of great. Definitely didn't plan it this way, but... We're in the midst of a brutal heat wave here in Austin, triple digit temperatures that feel higher than 114 degrees when you account for humidity. Yeah, it's a great time to be alive in Austin, Texas. Um, In order to record, I have to turn off the air conditioning because Dustin is a real stickler for audio quality, which means I can't do much recording to round out this episode anyway. I mean, we just... I'm turning off the air conditioning for about 10 minutes to finish up this episode, and I can already feel the sweat forming around my eyes. So I guess it's all working out that this was a really long conversation, way longer than we thought. (laughs) I don't know. Um, But we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. All right, Maggie. Ruby, everyone knows you. I know everybody is still still talking about this, the episode we did about gender, but why don't you both remind everyone of who you are? Sure. I'll go first. Uh, Maggie Green. Listeners, I'm, I'm sure you remember me. Uh, Amanda's called me a clothes horse all-star, which yep. is like one of the finer points on my resume. Um, <laughs> I... I describe my work as sort of the intersection of personal brand and style. So I am the chief everything officer and weirdo in residence at Maggie Green Style, which I describe as an ethical micro business on a mission to transform how you see yourself. And I work primarily with 
uh, what my clients refer to themselves as weirdos and queerdos. Uh, that's a community I'm part of as well. <laughs> so I should say my, my pronouns are she, her, and I'll end there. Cool. And Ruby? Hi, uh, my name is Ruby Gertz. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a fashion and costume designer. Um, I also have a small business on the side called Spokes and Stitches, where I sell downloadable PDF sewing patterns across a wide size range and two gender neutral fits. Um, I love all things sewing, pattern making, costume history, fashion history. Um, and yeah, I'm very honored to be a, this is my second time on Clothes Horse. And thank you so much for having me. Well, I am excited to talk about this subject with both of you. Um, back, back when I was in Japan, I specifically have the memory of creating the Instagram post on a bullet train asking for submissions, thoughts, experiences on dress codes and school uniforms. And so many people were so excited that the two of you were going to be who I was going to break this down with. So I think there are really high expectations today. I think we're going <laughs> to deliver. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Um, I said even before we started recording, this may be a two-parter. And by the time you're all listening to it, you will know whether or not is a two-parter. But it seems like there's a lot to talk about here. So dress codes and uniforms. I don't know about the two of you, but when we first started talking about this topic, I was really thinking about this macro level, historical perspective, social perspective, that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I took a moment to really sit down and think about this subject on my own that I realized that this has had an impact on many different aspects of my life since I was a child, that many of us every day are existing somewhere with, within a dress code or uniform situation. So I thought we could get started by just sharing some of our own experiences with it, how it has made us feel, um, and maybe you know we'll probably tie that all into all the other stuff we're talking about today. So Maggie, why don't you start by sharing some of your experiences with dress codes? Absolutely. And like you, Amanda, as soon as we decided we were going in this direction, it just unlocked all kinds of memories and connections and nostalgia. Um, when I think about dress codes for me personally, like my experience is largely with breaking the rules. Like when I think back, the most sort of standout moments where a dress code was like the focus of the interaction, it was always in situations where I was in trouble or being criticized or questioned <laughs> for certain choices. So um, one of the earliest memories I have of that was in middle school, which, you know, I think we all can agree. It's a really tough time socially, mm -hmm. biologically, uh, but also like on the wardrobe front, you know, it's, it's critical. It's really important, mm -hmm. high stakes. Um, and a couple of girlfriends and I decided we coordinated this like well in advance. We were all just as an aside, blonde and blue eyed, mm -hmm. uh, fair skinned. We decided that we were going to coordinate our outfits and our looks for a day. It was like a Friday or something. Black lipstick, black nails, black accessories, like full on goth glam mode, right? Uh, at, at some point during the day, we were called to the office as a group <laughs> and questioned, um, judged and threatened. Basically, they were like, if, if some shit goes down today, if anything happens, you know, if there's any trouble brewing, we're going to be looking at you all. <laughs> and oh it was my gosh. Like this specifically, is like, uh, yeah, this is classic. Should, yeah. <laughs> I should mention it was a school in the Florida Panhandle. Okay. Um, Florida, Florida may or may not come up in uh, later conversations today um, regarding dress codes. But yeah. Um, and I just remember thinking like it was, it was fucked up to begin with. It didn't make any logical sense to me. Like we were like pretty good students, you know, the high achievers. Like mm -hmm. we definitely weren't troublemakers. There was no reason other than our physical presentation that day to be questioned. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was fucked up. Um, so I definitely felt singled out. There was part of me and I think my girlfriends shared this as well. There was like 
an attract attractive component was like this is cool we're like rebels and we're ruffling <laughs> feathers like yeah although that was not <laughs> our intention you know it was just to be coordinated and um i guess visible but yeah that's that's definitely one story um i i broke so many rules you all in high school <laughs> i got called to the office one time um for I had stayed up all night the night before coming up with just the right phrase for this like Velcro letter t-shirt oh. situation. <laughs> oh, I had one of those. <laughs> and there's, right? This is like early 2000s, so late right, 90s. Right. Um, and I mean, I can't tell you how many different combinations and different, like I had a, a notebook full of options and there, there are only so many letters. So there were only so many different combinations I could do that it would be like, legible you know it would make sense so <laughs> like i could replace an s the letter s with a dollar sign and that would totally work um <laughs> so what i ended up landing on was fellatio apostrophe s fellatios for <laughs> the number four suckers and i oh, thought it was hilarious my God. <laughs> thought it was absolutely hilarious and i knew like not all of my peers are going to get it. So it's going to be a conversation starter. It's an opportunity yeah. to make like an off color <laughs> joke. But I was also concerned that like some of the adults, like the teachers and staff would be like, would totally call me out. So I had a little shirt that I wore over it, but I, I got caught in the copy room by a teacher who was not even my teacher who happened to catch a glimpse and read it. He turned beet red and he was like, Oh my gosh. He said, hold on a second. Turn back around. He's like, Oh my God. He said, has anyone seen that? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. I mean, most people don't know what the word is, but he's like, I'm going to go home and tell my wife. But I also think he might have told someone in the office because it oh, wasn't long after that. He's a narc. That I huh? got, yeah. Yeah. I got called in and the, it wasn't like a principal. We had deans at our high school. So it was a mm -hmm. dean. And I remember calling my mom and my mom knew that this was probably going to go down and was just like <laughs> laughing already about it. Like not even a big deal, but the, the Dean mispronounced the word fellatio and it no! killed me because I thought like, <laughs> how can you, how can uh, you get mad this at me? Gets better. <laughs> how can you get mad at me if you don't even know the fucking word? Oh like, gosh. right. How did so, you say it? Do you remember? Yeah, it was, oh my gosh. It was like with an Italian flair. It was like Filatiano <laughs> no! or something like that. Oh, no. uh, I don't think I've ever told that part of the story out loud. And I just cringe like hearing that played back in my mind. But yeah, um, I have I have other stories, but I, I want to hear some of your all's as well. I mean, I'll Maybe just, mix it up. I will just say, Maggie, your stories. I mean, while I never had the fortitude to create a shirt that, uh, you know, referenced fellatio, uh, <laughs> I, I saw myself in your story. Just, you know, I underwent a radical transformation in ninth grade, which I think a lot of people do, right? Like you get to high school and you feel like a little kid and you're like, who am I? Like, what's my identity? And mm -hmm. I got really into like alternative and punk music at that point, which meant my style changed pretty radically too. And I, you know, I've talked many times on the pod about how, uh, you know, kind of horrible of a parent my mother was, but one thing she did have going for her is that she would let me wear whatever I wanted. So I could go to school looking as wild as I wanted. And I was really into, you know, like thrifted clothing. I wore a lot of vintage, especially from the 60s and 70s. Definitely, if I wasn't wearing black wet and wild lipstick, there was this other color that was like so dark red. It was almost black. I wore that one mm. forever. So I definitely had a look going on as much as anyone who's like 14 in central <laughs> Pennsylvania can. And I was also a straight A student, had been forever a classic overachiever, you know. And nonetheless, I remember our sister, my, the assistant principal, who was like total, just the cliche of the assistant principal, right? The guy who like brings you in and harasses you or in me, in in like any sort of like school assembly would be like people, you know, like that <laughs> just like total cliche, right? That like buzz haircut. He said, I'm keeping an eye on you. I know you're on drugs. And I was like, uh -oh. what? And he's like, anyone who's not on drugs wouldn't look this way at school. 
And oh, I was like, wow, oh, okay, well, I guess just to spite you, I won't be on drugs. But, you know, like, it's just funny, like, nothing about me changed in terms mm-hmm. of, like, my behavior at school, my performance in school, I was in, like, every activity, you know, I was, like, a model student, I just looked different. And it did feel like... I don't know there was this silent dress code, like technically nothing I was wearing was a dress code violation, but in his mind, it was indicative of illegal behavior. I mean, it's no fellatio shirt. No one can top that, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty um, good. How about you, Ruby? Yeah, so it's funny. I, um, you know, when I was thinking about this episode, it was like, I didn't not, it wasn't really until like right before we were recording this. And I was like, well, how does this relate to me personally? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have that experience a lot. And I was like, Oh wait, and it, dress codes haven't been a problem for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. So I was like, I was trying to think of some stories and I, I have a lot of stories like from adulthood and like jobs and stuff. But I was thinking back like even earlier, um, And I do remember, I don't think that there was specifically like a dress code in kindergarten, but I was also like a very (laughs) adventurous dresser. And maybe this was like some foreshadowing that I was going to go into fashion and be like a pattern maker and draper. Um, But I went through this phase where my mom just had these like yardages of like lace that she had picked up at like a thrift store or something. And I would just like wrap myself in them. <laughs> and I, one, there was one time that I was, I wanted to go to school in that outfit that was like literally just like, you know, a kindergartner wrapped in lace. <laughs> and my mom was like, I don't, I don't think this is going to go over so well. And I was like, no, like, let me, let me do this. And like, bless her heart. She like, basically we lived across the street from my elementary school. So she like walked me across the street, basically was like, sure. Like, Let's see what happens. Um, and I believe they sent me home to change. <laughs> they were like, yeah, uh, you have to have real clothes on, Ruby. Sorry. Like, you can't just have, like, a yardage of lace wrapped around yourself. <laughs> I mean, Ruby, this is a problem I even face as an adult because I'm frequently <laughs> like, sure, it's just a square of fabric or a bathrobe. But if I put a belt on with it, yeah, isn't right? it a dress? <laughs> Totally. It's a vibe. Totally. Like, it was attached. I had, like, tied it somehow, you know, like, it was staying on. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. And I, I have another another memory of, um, I went through a phase, started, started in high school, and I think it went through, like, probably the end of college, maybe even after that, where I decided that I was going to be, like, that person that wore cowboy boots just, like, every day as my casual mm. footwear. Yeah, like, I grew up in Massachusetts, and like I've been a vegetarian since I was three years old. So I have like, no <laughs> business with cowboy boots at all. <laughs> but I just decided they were really cool. I think I probably saw the movie Footloose or something, and was like that. Like that's a good look. Yeah, um, they are and cool. I, yeah, I know. And I, I remember one time um, in high school, like you know, we were supposed to bring clothes to change into in like gym class. And I must have forgotten my gym clothes or something. And I was wearing my cowboy boots. And I just remember the gym teacher, like, scowling at me with such, like, you know, he was so, like, oh, you're wearing those shoes. And I had to, like, sit on the sidelines, basically, and just, like, watch everybody else do gym because I, like, couldn't do it in the cowboy boots. And he just, <laughs> he just like, glared at me with, like, such disdain for, like, the whole class. And I was like, uh, <laughs> like, what are you going to do, bud? Like, I don't know. It's gym. <laughs> class i don't get why this is such a big deal <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah so those are those are my those are my early dress code stories you know this is only tangentially related and it's just about having weird shoes maybe um i have never really confessed this publicly before but when i was in elementary school i had to wear orthopedic shoes mm-hmm. like prescription shoes Mm. uh, because I have flat feet and so I was having a lot of like ankle and knee problems because of it and so here I am I'm like third grade all you want to do is wear like cool sneakers or something right I mean that's like what it is and I'm wearing like weird nurse shoes to school and I was allowed to only wear sneakers for gym class and so I'd have to be like embarrassingly like changing my shoes before and after class and my mom would be like did you wear your sneakers all day I'll be able to tell like it was so (laughs) mortifying Um, Damn. and it really turned into me, like, as I reached, you know, my teen years and no longer had to wear nurse shoes to school. I mean, literally nurse shoes, like beige with like weird, 
st- I don't know, like special like insoles. square and, toe. Yes, yes. Ooh, which is like yeah. the last thing when you want to wear in like fifth, sixth, seventh mm-hmm. grade. Um, and it turned me into like, I, you know, as, as it happens when you become a teenager, you're really swinging the opposite direction. And I would only wear sneakers at any situation because I felt like I was like taking control of my life <laughs> you know <laughs> which totally. also and sometimes those weren't appropriate either right like w- you know at least appropriate according to someone it's just like funny the ways in which we uh, as we're growing up really try to assert our independence and how there are often many systems that sort of say like no sorry you're not allowed to do that or you can but we're going to make sure you feel weird mm-hmm. yeah. right Mm -hmm. social pressure is a huge thing too like i think even if something isn't like written down or like Mm -hmm. you know it's not a rule that you could read out of a book or it's not like on the wall like there's still so much social pressure to look and act and be a certain way so many unwritten dress codes Mm -hmm. really i mean we just talked about like half a dozen that were in writing like i'm sure i mean okay maybe maggie's school handbook said something about not wearing tees with like objectionable language or something on them and (laughs) fellatio may have fallen into that but like i'm pretty sure they probably never said don't wear black lipstick yeah no you know or no right (laughs) but yet like people took it's like judgment time like oh man we got to get her down to the guidance office she probably needs a talking to she's probably about to like take some left turn and ruin her life Right. <laughs> so, speaking of judgment, I have to tell this story. It's another I don't okay. think I've shared publicly, but like just on the note of judgment and social pressure, um, we're all probably familiar with the grapevine or like the gossip train, whatever you want to call it. Like, I did not realize that such a thing permeated through like the staff and faculty <laughs> at an institution. But, oh, yeah. um, well, we were adults now, so we know. Right? Now we know, yeah. <laughs> So, like, not too long after the Fellatios for Suckers t-shirt incident, <laughs> I was in I was in another class where a student had told me, that, like, we had the same English teacher, but not the same class, period. So, mm-hmm. they were like, I don't know if you heard this, but so-and-so, I remember her name, but I will not call her out publicly here. She, so-and-so teacher was talking about you in class, used you as an example in Ooh. their lecture or their whatever. I was like, what do you mean? So apparently, I don't know what the context was. It was English class, so who freaking knows? But yeah, she was like, so you all know Maggie Green, right? As if, <laughs> what the, like, as if everyone would. That was kind of <laughs> weird. But, you know, she's Celeb. like, she's that, she's that girl. She's a sophomore. She's got all those piercings and the short spiky hair. And she wears all those weird clothes. And she just, like, made this, like, wild comment. And it was like, it turns out you'd never think. But she's, like, one of the nicest per- people you'll ever meet. <laughs> as if, like, <laughs> my style uh... choices we're in direct conflict with those expectations like okay so piercings maybe especially diy ones are like what a weirdo like she's violent or like dangerous i don't know Aww. maybe to myself I mean, this, this is like you know like the whole like trench coat mafia thing that like suddenly we're rounding up all the boys who wear black trench coats to school because they might do a school shooting mm. it's like haven't any of you ever heard of nick cave like what's wrong with all of you you know seriously it's a style <laughs> statement get with it i know i know i think it's like so i mean you know when i was a kid when i was a teenager the teachers seemed like they were impossibly old and had never lived life right and they lived in their own weird teacher bubble but you know i'm at the point in my life and i'm sure both of you are too where you have friends who are teachers oh, so many friends. and they're still like interesting funny or maybe they're train wrecks like there's a the whole spectrum <laughs> right and they're cool and uh you know i i look back and i'm like i don't understand like did none of my teachers had they had ever heard of like nirvana or goth culture or you know like raves or like where where did they live mentally because i would hope i'm sure teachers today are like oh yeah uh, you know i'm on the internet i know what's up i don't know (laughs) but i just i i think it's so funny how these teachers are just like what like i don't understand this (laughs) at all so out of touch yeah like how could that be we know teachers and they're cool (laughs) right yeah Yeah. I i don't know 
I, I do think the yeah the internet I think has probably changed a lot of that in terms of just certain trends right. being more visible. Like I don't know, you just see a lot. I mean, more. if I were a teacher, I would be like, "Have you even lived if you haven't tried to pierce your own nose?" Come on. <laughs> It's like a rite of passage. <laughs> Same, yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's talk a little bit about like uniforms and stuff for work. Like, for example, I've worn a lot of uniforms, like literal uniforms, not just like dress code. Like at at Starbucks, it was ugh, the only time in my life I've bought khakis, mm. and it felt so just demoralizing Ooh. to me as a person who at least at that point in time, primarily wore black clothing. It felt like I was wearing a costume. And it was also like I have to buy something that I would never wear in real life. So it's just like extra stuff I have to buy. You know, and I wasn't making very much money. Um, one of my jobs at waiting tables, kind of one of my favorite ones in a weird way, was this diner. And I would work third shift there. And I would actually make a lot of money because, well, a lot of money to me at that time. Uh, because all my friends would come and hang out and give me big tips because I would just let them smoke and have as much coffee as they wanted. <laughs> and uh, that one, I remember specifically when you started, they gave you two polo shirts. Um, and that sounds like, oh, that's nice. Two shirts, that's great. But if you work five days a week, you get into a situation where you're like, I can't keep these clean. And they smell like greasy food. Ew. And they're polyester, so they also don't breathe. And you just feel, like you put it on, and you just feel sort of deflated. Yeah. Like your self-worth plummets. Um, even though I like understand that, it, you know, uniforms like that are so that people know that you work there. Right. And you're not some rando just delivering food and taking <laughs> orders. And I'm, it, you know, it it lends a sense of like professionalism and uniformity, literally mm -hmm. uniformity and figuratively to the experience for people. But man, I just can't explain it. I actually really loved waiting tables and I liked my job, but there was something about putting on that uniform that just made me feel like, whoa. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm curious, Ruby, if you've had any food service experience is when as soon as Amanda said like the restaurant environment and khakis, it was like not oh. not quite triggering, <laughs> but like I'm I'm back there. <laughs> back yeah. there in that moment yeah. like I, I can like smell the shirt yeah. and it's a little bit like man oh, no. all the time no matter what <laughs> <Yes>. yeah <laughs> yeah i actually i actually have not had any food ex food service what? experience but i've worked a lot of like kind of other like blue collar jobs i would say or like labor jobs where you're like in like a dirty mm -hmm. environment like a shop environment like i was a bike mechanic when i moved to philadelphia back in 2017 and like there's like this expectation that you're just going to like get your clothes really dirty all the time. Um, that job, they actually gave us a bunch of like branded safety gear to wear, which was pretty cool. Like on the first day, mm -hmm. they would just be like, tell us your size. And they would just like give you like one of everything. And then it was like, let us know if you need more t-shirts or whatever, but definitely like that stuff got so filthy so quickly. Um, mm. cause we were like out in the streets of Philadelphia, like mm -hmm. fixing bikes. And I would just be like covered in sweat and grease and like, street crust street crust <laughs> um and yeah and i also actually had a different job um it's funny when you were saying like you wanted to wear all black amanda because my, my first job after college was actually working in a dye shop um and so it was like kind of an informal dress code that we had to wear black because you're splashing dye all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. So that was another <laughs> job where I, like I got really dirty. Um, and so I would just, I remember like, cause I also didn't want to get anything too precious. Cause I'm like, well, it's going to get ruined. So I'd just go to the thrift store right. and buy a bunch of like crappy black t-shirts. Um, but yeah, it, like that always felt kind of like, it was kind of a cool job like it felt like kind of cool work but also like just putting on those black outfits was like it felt really it was like oh i don't get to have any like personality today like i'm just like this right? like bland yeah. laborer going to my like dirty job um and i think about that even now like i work in like a fabrication shop and so i'm often wearing like outfits to work that like it has to be okay if i like get some glue on it or paint or spray paint or you know, whatever other materials and like I get sweaty. And so it's like, I often feel like I'm not <laughs> like, I've also had office jobs in the past and there's something about like 
feeling a little more dignified, I guess, when you're putting on this outfit that's like very like customer mm-hmm. service facing versus being like more like doing more like manual labor where you're like, I'm just going to be dirty and I'm driving to work. Nobody knows I'm going to work. I don't look like I'm going to work. I don't look mm-hmm. professional. I just look like a person wearing like a t-shirt and leggings. <laughs> um, mm. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Did do you, have you also done food service, Maggie? Did you have food service? Yeah. Friends? Uh, briefly, I had like two or three food service related jobs and I just remember like the standard, um, some of them had like, you know, sponsored branded t-shirts. One had a polo, but like khakis were the default and I, I cannot do them. Like I, I almost cannot even stand to look at them like in a store (laughs) or like on a web page. Yeah, no, same, same. (sighs) <sighs> and I, I love twill. I love denim. I love every other color except that weird, like, mm-hmm. anti-color. It's <laughs> just, mm-hmm. like, beige. I don't know. I just felt so not myself in them and yeah. so uncomfortable. Like, honestly, what I had to wear in khakis to work at Starbucks felt more like a uniform than when I was working at the diner and had to wear that polo shirt because I could just wear regular black pants with it Mm -hmm. because I was like, I wear black pants anyway, Mm -hmm. you know, like fine. But like wearing khakis, that's not me, Mm -mm. Yeah, you know, and it made me feel like I would be riding my bike to work in those khakis and be like, oh, people probably think I'm the kind of person who wears khakis. (laughs) (laughs) Like I can't explain it, but you know, I mean, if you know, you know, right? And it definitely, it it was sort of like, I mean, I hate, this sounds melodramatic, but it was really demoralizing. And I also really loved working at Starbucks um, because everybody I worked with was really smart and funny and creative. And it was, I liked making drinks for people and stuff. But man, putting those pants yeah. on, it was like I had to give myself a talking to every morning oh. to get through it. Oh. You know, and they get dirty. It was so weird. What a weird choice. Yes. Yeah. Well, fun fact about the history of khakis. I didn't even write this in the notes or anything, but I was just thinking about it. So I was like, where did khakis even come from? And I believe they're actually Nightmare. military. <laughs> it was actually like military surplus. Uh, um, like yeah. after World War II, um, it was like what a lot of people going to college, like on the GI bills would wear to school. Cause it was uh. just like what they had. And it was considered this sort of like poor working man's like nice apparel <laughs> like nice in like quotation marks um hmm. and so it, yeah it kind of has this like interesting kind of like working class like americana military roots um which is interesting that, that it's ex- kind of filtered down into this yeah like these customer service facing jobs yeah, totally. I mean, you see it like if you go to like Best Buy or something. Totally. You know, like it is has really become part of the customer service uniform. I'm sure if you went to like a Verizon mm-hmm. to like, you know, get your phone looked at or something, probably the people there would be wearing khakis. It's this whole idea of like business casual, yeah. but it's also been adopted by food service in some places. It is it it is interesting. Workwear <laughs> professional or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. The military connection made me think of cargo pants and cargo oh, yeah. pockets. Like, mm-hmm. okay, so there is an explanation. There's an origin. At one <laughs> point, like those things actually made sense to accommodate, <laughs> right. like you yeah. know, materials, <laughs> yeah. things for like home repair or I don't know, <laughs> ammunition. Yeah. I mean, so speaking of like khakis, cargo shorts, and like sort of unwritten dress codes that are based in social pressure. Last week, I met some uh, some friends at a hotel bar downtown, and it was in a neighborhood uh, that I don't really ever go to. Where it's like a party neighborhood, basically. You know, every city has one, right? And Justin met me, and then we were leaving, and we walked down to the street, and this like I don't know, it was like ten, fifteen men walking towards us, and for a moment, I thought that they were part of some sort of like dance troupe or something because they were all wearing the same outfit and it was like khaki shorts and polo shirts, but all of different types, Mm. but still like, like this was the social uniform. Mm -hmm. If you're one of us dudes, this is what you're going to wear. And that really struck me as well, because I mean, I think we have all felt at different times in our lives pressure to, you know, conform to the group we want to belong to, right? I think many of us have outgrown that at this point. So when I hang out with my friends, we all look very different. (laughs) Um, No one's showing up in a matching outfit, but I definitely remember the pressure of like junior high school of really having to like wear what everybody else was wearing. 
And I think, you know, for many people, that also extends into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And that's another sort of just unconscious dress code. Oh, that also makes me think of like the like bridesmaids dresses <laughs> or even oh. like or even like not even like the bridesmaids dresses are, are horrible and I hate them. And if anybody asks me to have one again, I like absolutely no is my answer um but uh for the record yeah, there we go for the record. <laughs> yes it's official but uh you know it's like the dresses but also like i don't know if you've ever if you've ever been part of a wedding party and they get like t-shirts or something like printed for oh. like the bachelorette oh. party where it's oh. like i'm with the bride it's like single use like you're just like oh god you know but speaking of social pressure yeah. right like if you show up and you're handed a t-shirt and you're like I don't want to wear this. It's like suddenly you've created this huge social conflict. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It's true. I mean, there's, there are just so many different elements of this dress code in our lives. And, you know, another way it manifests that's not always like so black and white as like you have to wear khakis and a black button up or whatever is when you work retail. Mm. So I started my fabulous career in buying at and really that was working in the stores as a sales associate that led to that. And, you know, like they, there wasn't a dress code outside of like, oh, you need to wear closed toed shoes. You need to be like somewhat covered up at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like don't wear things that are dangerous and prevent you from being able to do your job. Like you definitely weren't allowed to wear flip flops. That was specifically in the manual. But in what it also said is that you need to dress on brand Hmm. for the business right so you couldn't come in in khakis for example mm -hmm. that would be the wrong, <laughs> wrong brand. <laughs> outfit for this job but there was you know also sort of like hey you can get this employee discount it's 40 percent off that's you have clothes to wear to work and you don't exactly have to wear those clothes to work but it's sort of like dot 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 you know like it's implied yeah. and i definitely found you know when i first started working there i was like i can't afford these clothes they are more than i make in a day like for one pair of pants you know and so i didn't ever buy clothes there i just kept wearing my thrifted stuff and someone said to me like hey if you ever really want to get promoted here you need to show that you're really into the brand oh. and part of that is going to be buying clothes from here and so the first time we had a big sale, I bought a bunch of clothes and started wearing them. And I am not kidding you. I was promoted within a month. Wow. And I think that's, you know, there are some retailers that say like, hey, you explicitly must wear these clothes. Like I remember, um, you know, American Apparel was one of those places that if you worked there, you had to wear clothes from there. And I'm sure there are other retailers like that, like probably Abercrombie or whatever. But then there are other places that are like, you know, just like look decent, look like you shop here but the pressure is still there to buy clothes from that company and when i think about that now it just makes my blood boil because for one we've got people who really can't afford to buy those clothes you don't make sorry you just don't get paid well in mm -hmm. retail you shouldn't have to buy any clothes to go to work there and then it's like i having worked in on the buying side for so long in corporate i've seen how many of the places i worked have really used employee discount as like a as leverage to drive sales sometimes so they'll say like hey we're a little behind our sales plan how about we do like an employee appreciation where employees are going to get this additional discount we'll schedule it for the same day as payday and we'll have like really high sales that day because all the employees will buy stuff that's so insidious I, <laughs> i've seen Damn. like this has been most places i've worked yeah. you know and i so that part of it, it just feels so predatory. It feels obviously like really unjust that you would have to, that your retailer, that your, your employer's already making money off of you by you being there and doing the work, mm -hmm. right? But now they're like, yeah, but we actually, can we get some of that money back oh. that we pay you? Mm. Just, it's like the company store, yeah, right? totally. You know, and I just, I just hate that so much. Yeah. I don't know. Have either of you ever had to work retail? Yes. So I actually, I had one retail job. It was my first job and it was in high school. And I have to say, like, I think I was really lucky. Like it was kind of a unique situation. It was a consignment clothing store, like in the next Ooh, town over. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was not paid very well, but I was also like a teenager. And so most of the income I was making at the time, like I was very lucky that that, that income was like mostly disposable. Um, like I could spend it, you know, I didn't have to pay rent <laughs> essentially. Um, you know, I could spend it on whatever, you know? Um, but 
I, one of the really awesome perks to that job was we actually made commission. So like it, we oh. weren't paid super well, but like you would get commission to, that was store credit to use at the store. So like if I had like a great day where I made like, you know, $200 in over the course of my, you know, shift or whatever. And like everything was very cheap there. Um, or inexpensive, I should say. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I'd make like a couple hundred dollars in sales for the store and I would get like five to $10 like credited to my account, which would like add up. And I would usually be able to like get myself Mm -hmm. like an item or two, like almost like once a week, every other week. So I actually treated that store like my own like revolving wardrobe. Like I would just like spend (laughs) the store credit on like whatever cool outfits. And that was kind of when I got a lot of, um, I don't know. I, yeah, it was kind of a fun time in my life where I got to like experiment with fashion a lot um, because of that. So I feel like it was kind of a unique experience. Like there were definitely some retail aspects to that job that sucked. <laughs> like we had some really strange customers <laughs> that would come in and like some very odd regulars and people would shoplift like very frequently, which was really uh, unpleasant to deal with. Um yeah. And I would often be working there like by myself too. So that was kind of scary. Like sometimes people would come in and be like kind of creepy at me or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's not your typical retail experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. What about you, Maggie? I, I'm i trying to think like the closest I've ever come to retail is like the, I worked at a little wine bar and like spirits market cafe type of business Um, and I don't remember there being an explicit dress code necessarily. It was like, you know, we want you to be clean and neat, um, (laughs) quote unquote professional. Like most of the time I feel like I outshined my peers in that department. I was like, yes, I love business casual. I'm really going to take this seriously. Like just showing up as my best self every shift. Um, which sometimes was problematic because if I wore my really nice things and like spilled red wine, that was not cool. Um, but there were, there were two incidents where I, I kind of wish there had been a formal dress code in place. Um, one time I was wearing open toed shoes and from like Mm. 50 feet away from me, uh, a co-worker dropped a wine glass and like wow. literally one of the shards from the glass like oh. flew into the side of my foot unexpectedly <gasps> um so oh that was scary. Totally scary uh the other time that like stands out from that experience where i was like yeah i mean a, a, an explicit dress code would probably be in order here um i had this really cute like tunic dress it was a mini dress technically And normally I wore it with like, um, little stretch leggings or like tights or something, but this was summertime. So I thought I'm going to go bare leg. I'm just going to like brave it. And I had these really cool knee high boots. Um, but I happened to like crouch behind the bar to retrieve something from the printer. And like one of the managers happened to walk by right at that time and caught like the smallest triangular shaped peak at my underwear and like reported me which was yeah it was so mortifying he was the manager was an older gentleman so i understand maybe like it might have been awkward for him to come to me directly but like finding that out through someone else like the owner of the business and then thinking too like oh my god he's an he's an older man like i I'm generally fairly modest. Like I would never intentionally like walk that line. Like, you know, I mean, I might break the rules, but it's, it would never be like, I'm going to show my ass or like, my body. <laughs> you know, like right, I don't right. know in that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, I don't, I don't know how I ever got away with not working in retail, but it just never happened. Well, count yourself yeah. lucky because it's a really <laughs> tough job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, the, you, you see the worst of humanity, mm-hmm. but I think you do in a lot of service <laughs> jobs as well. <laughs> Have you ever stood in front of a closet brimming with clothes yet felt you had absolutely nothing to wear? And at the same time, you don't want to buy more and more new stuff. No way. Well, then... 
I'm excited to tell you about the Lucky Sweater app. This is not your typical fashion app, but a community-driven trading platform designed to revitalize how you engage with your wardrobe. I even did an episode with their co-founder and CEO, Carly, and I am an avid fan, just a major fan, of what Lucky Sweater is doing. Lucky Sweater disrupts the traditional cycle of buy, wear, discard by fostering communities where cherished fashion pieces and craft supplies can be traded. Yes, that's right. This is an app for swapping not shopping, allowing you to refresh your wardrobe, discover new brands, and develop your true personal style with a trusted community and without the burdensome baggage of overconsumption. We're all over that now, right? There are two vibrant communities within the Lucky Sweater app. The slow fashion community trades a treasure trove of sustainable brand pieces from Nettle Studios, Elizabeth Suzanne, Ilana Cohn, and so much more. Then there is the Me Made community where knitters, sewists, and DIY enthusiasts trade handmade pieces and surplus supplies. And the exciting news is... Lucky Sweater is set to expand to more communities, such as those focused on thrifted items, vintage fashion, and even children's clothing. I can't wait. But the trading is not all that's great about Lucky Sweater. Folks share advice and outfit and project inspiration in the community sections of the app. I mean, it's just, it's all about community. Someone needs to come up with a better name for an app that conveys the connections within it. If you're ready to make a sustainable and fun shift in your wardrobe, go ahead and download Lucky Sweater today from the App Store or Google Play Store and use the invite code CLOSEHORSE to join in. That's invite code CLOSEHORSE. Happy trading. Well, you know, I think we've touched on a lot of things that we're going to be unpacking in this conversation, which is like, okay, there are these implied dress codes. Uh, there are dress codes that exist, you know, due to safety. Closed-toed shoes is a great one. I've definitely had to have conversations with people about why they can't wear flip-flops to work, and it's not an aesthetic choice. It's really about, like, not losing a toe, oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, we've, ta- we've talked about how, you know, for some businesses, this is really how they signify who works here and who doesn't. Uh, and then, you know, with school staff, I mean, I could talk about school dress codes for 100 oh. years, and we're definitely going to talk about them later, but as far as I can tell, though, bulk of school dress codes are really just about policing girls' bodies. Uh, that's, mm-hmm. I'll just say it, that's <laughs> my feeling. Um, but, you know, there are there are a wide variety of reasons why dress codes and uniforms exist. We find dress codes in a lot of different places. School, workplaces, uh, you know, you actually pointed out, I don't think you said it out loud, Ruby, but it was in here that there are jobs where even you just have to wear a special t-shirt mm-hmm. for events, of which, you know, uh, great because the thrift store needs more of those uh clubs and bars actually will have rules about what you can wear um to be admitted i've definitely seen like you know no hats no sneakers you know no torn jeans it's kind of wild to think about having to dress to gain access to a place where you're going to spend money but you know a lot of that is rooted in a lot of racism and classism which we're going to unpack Um, There are malls that have rules about what you can wear. Um, Some malls will not allow large backpacks. They won't allow so-called gang colors. And they will really use this dress code, uh, not necessarily to keep people safe, but to eject people from the mall. Um, And other public spaces have, you know, a wide variety of dress codes. You know, one I talked about when we were preparing for this episode is that a lot of the towns on the Jersey Shore won't allow you to w- to walk on the boardwalk just in a bathing suit. You have to wear a cover up or other clothing. Yet many of those towns also forbid changing clothing in the bathrooms. Mm. So you're like, what am I supposed to do here? Like change in the car? I don't know. I, I I've I've done a lot of weird. I'm not really in here changing clothes. I'm seriously just using the bathroom, but I'm definitely changing clothes in, especially at Ocean City, New Jersey. I've gotten really good at that. Um, But, you know, there are a lot of weird rules. Uh, Some are safety oriented and some are just uh, nonsense. Uh, 
And, you know, like, I think that we often don't really realize how many dress codes and we're existing within at any given moment. So I thought, you know, we'd get started with Ruby telling us a little bit about the history of dress codes, because I think to understand why some of these are sort of misguided or uncomfortable or just feel wrong to us now, you have to understand where they came from to understand maybe why they feel wrong to you now. Mm-hmm. Totally. So Ruby, take it away. Okay, awesome. So in, in preparation for this episode, um, I read a book <laughs> called Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Ooh. Changed History by Richard Thompson Ford, who is a Stanford law professor. Um, and it's really interesting. I think the book came out in like 2021 or 20. It's like pretty recent. So it goes like right up okay. to like very current events. Um, so highly recommend if anybody out there like wants to read a lot about the history of this. Um, but something that I think is important to kind of grasp just like as a concept, um, is that dress codes have pretty much always existed, uh, whether they're codified into writing or unspoken, but enforced socially. So kind of like what we Mm -hmm. talked about, like, you know, maybe people just like making comments towards you or treating you a little differently because of the way you're dressed. Um, versus you know like things that are actually like laws um or like written rules uh but basically like there has never been a time in human history when anyone could literally wear anything they wanted um without it having some sort of social consequence so like any society any culture like you know there there wasn't i i at least you know as far as we know like there was never this like utopian world where everybody was just like wearing these like (laughs) you know, like asynchronous, like weird <laughs> garments. Like they've, oh, there's always, like we're always trying mm-hmm. to signal something with the way that we dress. And so there's always going to be sort of like these rules or expectations around it um, that are like informed by the society and like the bigger culture that we, that we live in. Um, so like when we talk about like patriarchy and racism and misogyny and all of that, like it makes sense, like, since we live in a world where, like, those things do shape our reality, like, of course, those things are going to make their way into our dress codes and how we interact with our clothing. Um, yeah. I also just want to mention, because, like, I don't know, I'm sure there's, like, a lot of fellow costume history nerds out there that listen to this podcast. Um, dress codes, it's, like, a PhD dissertation level topic. Like, it's something you could spend <laughs> yep. so much time on. I mean, literally, I listened to the audiobook of this book by Richard Thompson Ford and it was like 16 hours or something. So like there's, you know, we're not going to (laughs) cover all of it. So like, uh, sorry in advance to people who are listening, who are like really hoping we're going to touch on like this one, you know, like 18th century French sumptuary law or something like we might not get to it. So don't be disappointed. Um, (laughs) if we we don't cover like (laughs) your cool, your cool fact, um, or, you know, your own story or anecdote or something. Um, but yeah, so highly recommend dress codes. Um, it's called, it, the book is called Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Changed History by Richard Thompson Ford. Um, so something that he starts the book off with that I think is really interesting um, is this idea that all sartorial choices, uh, whether they're the wearer's own or mandated by an authority of some kind, they all signify four elements, which is status, power, sex and personality definitely Um, yeah so yeah so if you look at like any dress code ever like you you can kind of look at them in light of those four elements um Mm -hmm. and there will be something about it right like um yeah so i think that's like just kind of a cool way to like look at look at each each story or each anecdote like through that lens um yeah so (laughs) we'll take it way back to like the 1300s (laughs) um i i will say this book was kind of eurocentric in its approach Mm. um it focused very much on western culture so um just i don't know keep keep that in mind i guess um but yeah so basically uh modern tailoring kind of as we know it uh begins to emerge in the 1300s in europe um Apparently, like, some other civilizations arrived at it earlier. Um, There's, like, talk of, like, other uh, cultures wearing, like, pants and bifurcated garments, like, way longer before they actually reached um, Europe. Um, But basically, we had the plague, right? And, like, a huge chunk of the population died in Europe. Um, And one of the 
sort of like interesting social consequences of that uh, was that it left a lot of room for upward mobility. Interesting. And so a bunch of new professions emerged with the Renaissance. So we start seeing like the emergence of like craftspeople. So people start taking on jobs like tailors, weavers, dyers. Um, we see the rise of this new merchant class who are like moving these goods around um, sort of from town to town. And there's also this rise of literacy during this time period. Um, so prior to that, like most storytelling uh, was kind of like biblical or mythological, and it would be about like heroes and kings and these, you know, kind of like characters that we would put up on a pedestal um, as being kind of like more important than the average person. Um, and these characters were always kind of described in these like, I don't know, they're kind of personalityless. <laughs> like if you think about like, I don't know, like Hercules, right? <laughs> um, or or like characters from the Bible, right? Like Adam and Eve, like they don't have like cool personalities. Like no one's like, oh yeah, and he was like, had a great sense of humor <laughs> and like always made people laugh, right? Yeah. Like, it's just sort of like he did this thing and it was cool, you know? <laughs> We're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Very good point. Yeah, no one ever talks about like, was Jesus funny? What was his favorite color? Like, did he like cooking? Like, we don't know anything. Right? I think that would be so interesting to know. But it's like people didn't think that was like important to record that at the time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, no yeah. one was like, yeah, he made this really funny joke once. Like, <laughs> 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 he made this great bread. <laughs> it was so good. He was like a real prankster. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, so more people start to be able to read, start to learn how to read at, during this time. We start seeing like increasing, um, like publishing, um, like written books and stuff. And so we see the rise of the novel as a literary device. Um, and so because more people can read and write, people start writing about the common person and they start creating these like relatable literary characters, um, which sort of leads to this culture of more individualism. Um, which carries over into how people choose to express themselves through dress. So suddenly you're not just like, you know, farmer number three or whatever, you know, <laughs> or like, it's not so much about like, you know, defining yourself by like maybe your family unit or your religion or like these kind of larger social forces. It's kind of like, well, who am I as a person? Like, am I kind of, am I kind of flashy? Like, am I modest? Am I, you know, like these people start to like kind of consider these like, individual personality traits is like mm -hmm. having more value um mm -hmm. that they want to like portray visually um so yeah kind of kind of interesting and then also like the common people start getting greater access to luxuries because there's sort of this increasing global like globalization um and all of this increasing mm -hmm. trade like between different regions um and so you know and there's also all this upward mobility so somebody who may have been stuck you know, like farming wheat on a field somewhere, maybe suddenly has an opportunity now to like start, you know, trading with their neighbors and like becoming like gathering more wealth, you know, through like achieving like merchant status or something. Um, and so there's more upward mobility that's like happening during this time period. So, yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I thought that was just kind of really interesting of like, especially when we think about like those four, um, those four elements that are shaping like sartorial choices of um, mm -hmm. status, power, sex, and personality. This is like, seems to be like where the like personality piece starts to really like come into play, um, which I think is like probably maybe one of the most important factors now. Like I think all the stories we shared, like definitely leaned pretty heavily mm -hmm. towards like personality being the mm -hmm. focus. Um, yep. Yeah. So, you know, now that like, we're in kind of like Renaissance period. Um, and now that, you know, kind of anybody who has enough money can have access to all kinds of luxurious goods. There's all this conflict that starts to arise around who is allowed to wear what. Um, so there's this concept called sumptuary laws, uh, which started in Europe, um, mainly like England, France, and Italy. And they sought to enforce who had access to items deemed luxury or exclusive. Um, especially when suddenly these essentially commoners, you know, can afford the same <laughs> stuff as people who are like nobility, um, mm -hmm. and like ruling class. Um, how so dare th they? I know. So like literally there would be rules about like, you know, only the king can wear velvet or like only, you know, I'm kind of like making these up. There's like actual ones that existed, but it's like, you know, only people above this certain class or only people with, you know, this, 
title or whatever are allowed to wear like silk that's woven in two colors or like you know kind of like these very specific things yeah um and there's also this like rise of guild manufacturers at that time so there's all these specialized craftspeople who make things for these nobility and merchant classes um and so they're like you know making stuff and they it's even though like they themselves are laborers like they can't even wear the stuff that they're making Wow. Like, it's considered illegal for them to even, like, try it on. So maybe you're making, like, a gorgeous wig for a judge or something, but, like, you can't, like, try it on yourself while you're making it. Um, and people could, like, get arrested for that. Like, there was um, this really interesting part of the book where they talk about all of these, like, famous, like, raids that happened um, in certain <laughs> cities, like, in London and Paris, like, where it would be, like, you know, they uncovered, like, all these, like, this, like, black market of, like, wig manufacturers or, like, corset <laughs> manufacturers. And it's, like, not only were they making stuff for, like, these wealthy upper crust people, but, like, they also, like, secretly were making a bunch more and, like, selling them mm. to, like, peasants, you know? Um, and they would get in trouble for that. Um, so it's almost like the predecessor to, to like, unions, um, you know, kind of, like, protecting the like people protecting the work or like kind of saying like you have to go through this specific training program in order to like, you know, make this thing and be considered, you know, like a top crafts person at this thing. Like not anybody can just show up and decide they're going to make shoes or corsets or whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a interesting thing to think about, especially like as a maker myself, like, I was thinking about how, like, yeah, like, what, that's so interesting. Like, you're making something and you have to, like, be so careful with it. Um, and, like, you as the maker are kind of, like, under so much scrutiny of, like, who's it going to go to? And, like, you know, you're essentially, like, creating it, but you don't even get to wear it yourself. I know. I mean, I guess that's not unlike a lot of garment factories now, right? No. Like, I'm sure if you worked in any garment factory and tried on the clothes, mm -hmm. you would be fired. Oh, Totally. Um, totally. But it's it's still it's just like how demoralizing is that to you you know all you do all day is work mm -hmm. on things you don't even get to wear or can't afford mm -hmm. you know at this point of course obviously you're speaking about like it's just it's a legal issue which yeah. is even wilder gives me anxiety thinking about it but I mean this is not uncommon even now I guess yeah no that's like a really good point and it's funny because like even even in my work now it's like there's sort of a little bit of that like I, I work in a place that makes like. Um, puppets and props and costumes but like yeah like you wouldn't i'm like not thinking about it now and i'm like yeah i wouldn't like try that on probably without like asking my supervisor <laughs> first you know right like, yeah um yeah because it's like these very expensive things you know that like ultimately don't belong to you you're just sort of like the hands that create them um so yeah it's interesting um there's also let me see oh i also wanted to talk about because this i thought was really just like an interesting fashion history moment um it's called referred to as the great masculine renunciation um <laughs> yeah okay tell me <laughs> more like i love it already moment. yeah so the great yeah. masculine renunciation uh it starts in the 1700s and it's influenced by this growing emphasis on modesty as a virtue um this is kind of happening during the enlightenment and we're seeing sort of this increasing religiosity and this idea of like refined elegance um as this new goal to kind of replace this like excessive opulence so this sort of arose out of this idea of like well if anybody can afford to buy anything then i'm mm -hmm. gonna make myself look different and special through other means like if anybody can have like silks and tiaras and you know fancy high heel shoes like i'm gonna di distinguish myself from the masses in these other ways um so this is just like how people are <laughs> totally totally right and it still happens today right like something gets yeah, like trendy yeah. enough and then suddenly it's chuggy right <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so this is like that basically happening um but with like masculine fashion specifically and also like i feel like we're kind of still in this like i feel like this has this like continued legacy that is like still very much impacting like our culture and our society and especially how um like men and like masculine presenting people like interact with clothing um so yeah it's like if you know if suddenly anyone can wear jewels and crowns like we'll make jewels and crowns gaudy and move towards a style that's harder to emulate um so there's kind of this growing 
idea of like it's mm-hmm. kind of like the if you know you know kind of fashion mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. maybe it's not even fashion but it's like affectation it's like how you're carrying yourself that sets you apart um how you're walking your posture your confidence things like that um it's like this thing that everybody was talking about in the wake of succession <laughs> yes and, yes, and totally. i can't remember the term for it but it was basically oh. like you know, like how you know someone is actually rich and not pretending to be rich is that they have this sort of like silent affluence in terms of what they own. And I've seen, I can't believe I can't remember the term right now because I've seen so many people write think pieces about this on Reddit. Um, But, you know, it's this idea that like if you're wearing logos and you have the latest like it bag, like you're probably not rich. Mm Mm-hmm. And I thought that that, I mean, this is very similar to that. Totally, totally. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, how can you, yeah, how can you set yourself apart in a world where anybody can like have anything? And it's like, not, it's not even like material, like it kind of is material, but it's also not, it's like, in your knowledge of certain affectations or mannerisms to put on or your knowledge of like, yeah, like certain hotels or resorts that you might frequent or your private jet or something. <laughs> I was trying to find yeah. it. I don't know if this is it, but tell me, Amanda, maybe you'll know it if you hear it. Is it okay. stealth wealth? Okay. Oh. That is one of the terms for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wealth. And it's just it's just basically like it. This is a, a line of thinking that I feel like comes around periodically where if you know, if you're actually wealthy, you won't be showing it. But like if people, if you're in the know, you'll be able to say like, oh, that person's wealthy. That's like a $500 t-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. Or like that bag, you know, is like $5,000. It just doesn't have any logos on it. And I feel like there's kind of like a cycle of that where there's like a logo mania where everybody's being like really conspicuous conspicuously consuming like think about the 80s Mm. right and like even wealthy people at that point of it would have been like wearing like a huge gucci belt or something but then that fell out of favor right and suddenly if you're doing that you're really gauche you know you're like nouveau riche or something and i think that also can have something to do with like larger economic climate i remember my friend kim telling me that it, during the 2008 recession, people who were wealthy would feel embarrassed, like being conspicuously wealthy. So Ooh. if they went shopping at like Barney's, they would ask their, for their stuff to be put in a paint, plain paper bag. Or if, mm. you know, they went to like Chanel or something, same thing. So no one would see them walking down the street with like luxury goods. And I think it kind of connects to that as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this whole like stealth wealth has just been like in the era of succession, all anyone wants to talk about. Quiet luxury is the other one. Quiet, Quiet yeah, that's luxury. the other one. And so yes. like if you know, you'll know that that's like the finest fabric that someone can buy or that it's tailored super well just for them or it was made for them, which are definitely luxuries, right? Um, but how you won't know that it's luxury is that there will like not be some like a logo on it that like points it out to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so, like, the implication is that even if you, as an observer, can pick out this silent luxury, uh, then you are part of that as well. Oh, mm-hmm. by association. It's, like, silly. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're all looking for different ways in which we can feel valued or valuable. And, you know, that's one of the, like, mental games people are playing with themselves right now wow <laughs> yeah so there That's you go interesting. but also <laughs> it makes me think of like historically like how like kind of after the french revolution like it became very dangerous for monarchs mm-hmm. to like dress in this very like over the top way because like all of their subjects were suffering so much you know and so it was mm-hmm. considered like yeah it was kind of dangerous you're like oh i don't want to show that i have like all this stuff that they don't have mm-hmm. so let me try to like reel it in a little bit <laughs> yeah that's a really great example as well and i do think we're kind of like it's interesting to see where we are in this time because we still have influencers out there like buying the latest bag mm-hmm. and wearing a new outfit every day but i do think that there is right now a move away from that too, that you could judge someone as being a bad person or having poor taste or being chuggy mm. because they're wearing brands, luxury yeah. brands in conspicuous way. Mm. Um, and I do think it's because it's like, oh, it's just not a good look for you right now. You know, like don't yeah. do that, read the room. It's kind of a tough economic time for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. 
totally. I don't know, eat the rich, right? We're in a very eat the rich time. So, uh, you know, I think like that's picking up more, mom- more and more momentum. It began as like a TikTok kind of Reddit thing, but I start- I'm starting to see it in more mainstream outlets where like, you know, like having a private jet is kind of, you know, you should maybe be a little embarrassed, right? Yes. Um, and I think we're going to see that probably pick up even more momentum because now, unlike, say, in the French Revolution or the 2008 recession, we're seeing this intersect with, like, economic uh, injustice and mm-hmm. environmental justice. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing it at the same time. And I think that that is, like, you know, it's... I mean, listen, I'm sure it's really cool to be rich because you never worry about anything like I do every day. But it's also like not very cool to be rich. Right yeah. Now, you know? <laughs> well, and it's like they must kind of know it too, right? Like, I don't know. There must just right. be like, I don't, I can't imagine how there isn't like some guilt that they feel I mean, I w- being I so... wonder about that. Like Jeff Bezos went to Coachella and he wore this like nightmare butterfly print oh button up, gosh. and you know th- there there are things I hate about the internet, but there are so many things I love, and one is that there's always someone out there who's going to do the work to solve the question that everyone has, right? Mm. Everyone wanted to know this guy is a billionaire. Where did he get this horrible shirt? Is it from a special was place for rich guys to buy horrible shirts? It was. Uh, it was twelve dollars. Oh, twelve dollars, wow. and you know I of course I'm like laying you know, falling asleep at night thinking like, did he wear that? So he could be like, see, I'm just like one of you. Or is he just like, I love butterfly shirts. I don't give a fuck. Is he really thrifty? (laughs) Like I have a million questions. This is a guy who like stylist who picked it out for him. Like if if you saw this shirt, there's no way. No. (laughs) And is, I was like, this is a guy who like went to the moon (laughs) while people are like dying of COVID. So like, I don't know how much of a, how how much of a pulse he has on like the world right now and like Mm -hmm. sentiment but i did wonder if him wearing this like 12 dollars shirt was part of seeing like saying like hey i'm just like all of you i love butterflies and i you know wear amazon clothes go to coachella (laughs) to go to coachella yeah wow oh that makes me so sad too to think like some some laborer somewhere right like some set of some person uh, with a set of hands somewhere made that shirt, yeah. never knowing that it was going to end up on freaking Jeff Bezos' body. Mm-hmm. Like, what? It's sort of, I mean, like, honestly, to me, as a person who has, like I said, laid in bed multiple nights thinking about this <laughs> and trying to, like, crack the code of it all, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, like, Jeff Bezos, you don't give a fuck. Like, no. That you could buy something that was made ethically. You have Mm -hmm. all the money, right? You could have someone literally sew the clothes for you right now, Mm -hmm. right? But you said, no, I'll just buy this $12 Amazon shirt that definitely was made with, like, probably forced labor or at least, like, really exploited labor and is going to, like, maybe only last one wear. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Probably with khaki cargo (laughs) shorts, if I had to guess. I think he... Uh, no, he was wearing jeans, oh. but they were like very, uh, they were like just such dad jeans. Oh. Such, just, yeah. I mean, I was like, this is an interesting look, you hmm. know? Like, not not what I would have expected of Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really know anything about him, so maybe I'm not surprised. I don't know. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. 
Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriela Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriela Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Fagavon Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. <laughs> One of the things um, that I actually learned from this book, which is very interesting, um, was like the history of high heels. <laughs> oh, here yeah. we go. Um, yeah, I'll, ch I'll keep it quick. Um, but basically, uh, I believe it was there were these like Persian military horseback riders that like visited Europe. Um, mm -hmm. 
in i can't remember sometime like during the renaissance and the europeans like they wore um i guess the the horseback riders wore these like special shoes that helped their feet sort of like clip into the like stirrups whatever you call them horse pedals i don't know horse pedals definitely horse pedals definitely horse pedals <laughs> 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 oh my god um sorry can you tell i also ride a bike a lot <laughs> like the pedals like clip in um horse pedals <laughs> but yeah so the heels um but were like kind of like tall and so when they got off the horse they would like walk with this like gait that like high heels make you walk with um Mm -hmm. and it was men wearing them and everybody in europe was like holy shit this is like the like epitome of like masculine like refinement (laughs) like they look so sexy (laughs) <laughs> so manly so so manly I and love it, was, like, it was considered like a symbol of like virility too because like i mean if you think uh, about it when you wear heels right like your butt kind of sticks out like mm-hmm. you kind of hold yourself a little more up, are right? popping. um exactly exactly <laughs> people were really into male legs at the time that was just, like this erogenous zone that we were just like super into um, i mean i'm kind of into male legs right now <laughs> yeah so i mean they're maybe always I was good, just born in the but... wrong time i don't know <laughs> but like, a lot of sculptures at the time like had like really muscly legs and stuff so it's like it's kind of funny um but yes they were just like super taken with this look and they were like we have to recreate it so for centuries it was men that wore high heels and it was considered this like very masculine thing and so then during the great male renunciation such a good term (laughs) um, (laughs) men started to give up their high heels because they were like oh this looks too frivolous this like you know we have to prove that we're like rational thinkers and like you know having we're more refined than that right like we'll show we'll show our sexiness in other ways and so they essentially like all of these symbols of luxury that had been these sort of hallmarks of like men's fashion started being transferred to women and it was kind of this almost idea of like trophy wives of like well i can't show all of my wealth i'm not gonna wear all this opulent stuff but i'll have my wife wear it and like by proxy <laughs> because my wife is like connected to me like people will see that i have a lot of money whoa um, oh, yeah. interesting <laughs> so why didn't ever switch back you know, that's this one's been going strong. Question, Amanda. I know, right? Yeah. Maybe it's just yeah. a very long trend cycle. <laughs> Any day now. <laughs> Any yeah, day you now. Said we're still now. in the great male renunciation, right? Like, <laughs> I'm here I for think it. we are. I think we are. <laughs> yeah. I just think the great male renunciation has taken on like a different vibe and mission in this century. <laughs> it's really like Me Too, where we're like renunciating bad behavior. <laughs> But, uh, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, totally, totally. I know the first time they, like, talked about this in the book, I was like, the what? <laughs> and now I'm just like, great male renunciation. Wow. Um, yeah. So, anyway, so I thought that was just kind of an interesting interesting anecdote. And I, th- I do think that that's kind of carried through into, like, our dress expectations, like, especially as informed by sex, which again is one of those four pillars. Mm -hmm. Um, And also Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify, like when he says sex in the book, I, I am assuming that like what he actually means is like gender and gender expression specifically. Right. Okay. Um, Yeah. Cause we, you know, like we talked about in our last episode together, like sex and gender are not necessarily the same thing. Right. Um, It's kind of interesting that no one who was editing that book was like, Hey dude, just like want to let you know that like this might be a little, well, I also think but. it's really, int- and I don't want to go into too much. I'm not going to like do a whole full book report. I feel like I already just kind of did. Um, but he actually <laughs> has like some really interesting um, chapters in the book that like explore specifically like trans figures from history and like how dress codes were or were not enforced um, on those people. And it's like goes like way back. Like it was actually, I learned about like some people I had never heard of before. Um, so it's, cool. he takes like great care, I think, to like address that and address gender and like how that has played out kind of like through the centuries. Um, mm-hmm. So I, yeah, I don't think he's like unaware of it, but for me, I'm just like, that's gender expression. That's mm-hmm. not sex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is interesting though, to hear you talking about this, like, cause I already know everything else we're going to talk about today. And I will say that we see a lot of echoes of the great masculine renunciation in terms of dress codes around professionalism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it's mm-hmm. so obvious, right? Totally. Uh, um, and once again, we said like when we started this like journey into history that all of these things were going to play into the dress codes that we 
deal with now, whether they are officially in writing or unspoken. Mm-hmm. 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 Totally. Um, yeah, I had pulled out like a whole bunch of interesting tidbit- tidbits from this book, but I also feel like maybe in the interest of time, um, we might want to like move on. Give us the tidbits. We're going to see yeah, a two-parter. It's they're fine. They're too good. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, they're good. Yeah, all right. And- all right. <laughs> One that caught my attention, um, I think maybe specifically because I'm Jewish, um, but there was this anecdote about how in um, 15th century Italy, Jewish women were forced to wear earrings um, by this guy, Friar Bernardino, who was like the Catholic Italian head curmudgeon in charge um, <laughs> who basically like looked at, you know, looked at Italy, saw that there was like kind of this like beautiful integrated society happening where people were like commingling across religions and across races. And he was like, Oh no, 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 we can't have that. Um, so he decided to write these dress codes um, basically to try to enforce this like Catholic superiority. Um, and so he, there was this law on the books um, that Jewish women had to wear earrings to signify um, that they were Jewish. And it was at this time when they, um, there was, you know, the, the fashion at the time was to dress really modestly. Like it was kind of seen as like, <laughs> kind of like what we we're talking about, like the stealth wealth thing. Like it was seen as like tacky to like wear like gold jewelry. Yeah. Um, Cause it was like, Oh, you're like flaunting your wealth. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting because that is kind of like this negative stereotype um, about Jewish people that comes up again and again mm-hmm, of like mm-hmm. being, you know, like wealthy or being gaudy or like having, you know, having this kind of like conspicuous wealth of being tied to money. Um, and so this idea that this was like visually enforced, um, that Jewish women had to wear earrings, I thought was really interesting. And also it wasn't just Jewish women that had to wear earrings. It was also prostitutes. So wow. there were oh, wow. all of these, yeah. So during, um, like 15th century Italy, um, and probably the centuries before and after too, like there was kind of this whole, idea of like well how do we how do we tell prostitutes apart or you know sex workers um apart from like quote unquote like other people i guess um and so there were like all these dress codes that were basically imposed um so that you would basically be recognizable you know and it really plays into these negative stereotypes about sex workers as well that they're like deceitful or like you know constantly like seeking customers mm. not just like people moving through the world um so yeah i thought i thought that was really interesting and then apparently at a, at a certain point earrings started to come back into fashion <laughs> and then they were like okay never mind you actually jewish women and sex workers can't wear earrings of course <laughs> right. now we're switching it up like oh you actually look trendy now <sighs> no we get this. wow <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah it was pretty wow wild um yeah. So anyway, people people trying to create social division with, with dress codes is definitely um, persistent, I think. Um, you know, trying to pit people against each other or mm-hmm. enforce um, social status. There's um, the book actually has a really, I would say, like leans really heavily um, into like civil rights movement and explaining how clothing played a really big role in that. Um, there's a very kind of large, like black liberation through line throughout the book, um, which I really appreciated, um, talking about, uh, like clothing that enslaved people were first forced to wear in the United States, um, and sort of how that like transformed, um, once enslaved people became liberated, um, and you know, how like rules were enforced, um, through like the Jim Crow era of like who could wear what. Um, this idea of like respectability politics that comes up a lot, um, especially in like activism spaces. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't know. There's so, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much there in is. this book. Um, there's even a chapter about nuns habits, um, oh, like wow. the origins of that outfit and like how that has changed throughout the years, which I thought was super interesting. Um, the idea of like conspicuous modesty and how, like when you're dressing in a way that's like intended to cover your figure like so much to obscure it it almost 
has like the opposite effect of people like imagining what's oh, under yeah. the oh. horse. Like, yeah. And so how like nuns habits have become this thing that's like simultaneously like seen as like <laughs> kind of really dowdy, but also kind of sexy. Like, also yeah. Makes an yeah. Appearance, like, in this, like <laughs> yeah, like in these like very like counterculture kind of um, spaces. So yeah, I thought, um, it was all. It was all really good. Highly recommend. <laughs> check it out. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check out this book. It sounds really, really cool. Yeah, it made me want to read a lot more about, um, you know, these different time periods, too, as well as, like, just kind of more more fashion and costume history stuff. Like, I feel like there's just always more little great nuggets of information. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maggie, did you have something that you wanted to, while we're in the history, going through the history, you wanted to say something about Title IX? Yeah, you mentioned Was civil rights. So, um, yeah, sex discrimination in general, race discrimination certainly comes to mind. Title IX, um, I'm not sure exactly when it went to an, when it went into effect, but I have 1972 as like kind of the moment in time where um, federal law. Pre- like started prohibiting sex discrimination in schools and also discriminatory dress codes, um, making it no longer a requirement for like feminine presenting, you know, women and girls to wear dresses and skirts exclusively. So it's kind mm-hmm. of a, a pivotal moment in time. Like all of a sudden, right. Women and girls can wear pants without, um, necessarily that, like immediate social backlash or in the case before this was put into federal law, like, you know, punitive consequences, um, being asked to leave school or being punished or humiliated publicly or like any, any number of things. It is interesting though, because like there are still so many dub, I, I just feel even now in 2023 that so many of school dress codes specifically really target girls Right. And it's really about policing their bodies. Um, You know, I was telling all of you, like my school had a rule that it just I mean, it's ridiculous that girls couldn't wear sleeveless shirts, but boys could. And that was the kind of thing you could be sent home for, for wearing like a tank top, which feels like so 1950s to me. Um, And there were a lot of other rules about just like length of shorts and whatnot for girls, Mm -hmm. but not for boys. And you know, it's not, I mean, to be fair, it's not like boys were showing up to school at my school, at least wearing short shorts and tank tops, but they could if they wanted to. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, I mean, I know that there are still so many rules around like skirt lengths and tops and the kinds of like pants that girls, and I'm, I'm, I'm really using like the very generic term here, girls, because this is how schools look at dress code is in a binary mm-hmm. of boys and girls. And so I like I'm speaking to the way that's discussed, which is also problematic. But I I did see a lot of double standards like that growing up. Now, after ninth grade, where my vice principal was convinced that I was on drugs, my mom decided it was time for me to go to private school. Um, not because of that. I'm pretty sure I probably never told my mom that because it was very embarrassing. And I'm the kind of person who feels guilty for things I've never done. So I would have felt guilty for doing drugs, even though I hadn't, (laughs) just by saying it out loud to my mom. Um, But so I started going to private school and we had a really strict dress code there. And actually, you know, like you reminded me, Maggie, when you're talking that at my school, boys had to wear pants and girls had to wear skirts or dresses. No sneakers were allowed except for in gym class. You know, the idea was that you're supposed to dress up. Now, of course, kids got all around that by like, you know, Strangely enough, a lot of the boys I went to school with, they would seriously spend their lunch break listening to Rush Limbaugh, and they would show up, I know, in, like, button-up shirts, khakis, and then, like, Tevas with socks. Oh, Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. And a lot of the girls dressed, like, in what I call, like, rich hippie clothes, you know what I'm talking about, Mm. where they were, like, very bohemian, but the clothes were really expensive. Mm -hmm. And neither of those were aesthetics were for me. And I also, you know, like was not going to be able to participate in their uh, quiet luxury. Um, So I didn't have that kind of like, you know, a socioeconomic background. And so I actually went to the Salvation Army and I bought a whole bunch of school uniforms. And that's what I wore to school every day 
with school mm. uniforms for some other school. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, it, it, and, you know, I was like, I meet dress code and it looks like I'm doing just something like really cool and weird, which is fine, too. You know, and I would wear Doc Martens because I was allowed to wear those to school. So it was like a very Ooh, like yeah. grunge kind of thing to do. But that's that's how I coped with that dress code, which in retrospect, I feel like it was such a progressive school. But here we are saying like, oh, no, like girls can't wear pants to school. You know, right. and also then like, seriously, can I just say all the boys I went to high school with were just like the worst people ever, <laughs> like super Republican in like 10th grade, you know? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So what a weird it was a weird uh, set of people. Um, but anyway, you know, I think that. You know, dress codes still, particularly in schools, I think they get around a lot of sort of like what's legal or ethical because there is this larger, whether it's unconscious or otherwise, uh, decision or at least belief that many people, especially many parents have that like we need to uh, cover girls' bodies. Mm -hmm. It's for the safety of everyone, right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that that's a lot of weight to have on your shoulders yeah. if you're being raised as, as you know, a girl, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, 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 that's a lot. It comes from, I feel like it comes from such a place of like this very like victim blamey culture too. Yeah. Of, like, mm -hmm. of like, oh, you're, you invited the attention, right? Like this thing that somebody did that was inappropriate in your direction, like you invited that as your fault. Like if you're, mm -hmm. if your if your strap had been three fingers wide instead of two fingers, wide, oh. you know, like it's like, this yes. might not happen. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember one of the parts of the dress code when I went to public school was that your bra strap couldn't be visible. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, as if going through puberty and the changes to your body aren't mortifying enough to then be fretting that someone's going to see your bra strap all day. Right. That's that's tough. That's not fair. And I think, you know, a lot of this is like, oh, well, I feel like if boys see girls bra straps, then they won't be able to focus on their schoolwork. Like, it's that kind of thing. And it's like, <laughs> I think we have a bigger problem there. If that's, right? that's what you think is so, going to happen. Hormones are raging no matter your gender expression in that time frame. Right. Like middle right. school, high school. There's also like largely no education or content around like. Okay, so there's all the victim blaming, putting all the responsibility on the the kids that are socialized as female, but like nothing that says don't teach your male children or you know teach your male children not to do this, not to sexualize you know their their um, you know feminine counterparts, however you want to call it. Like, yeah, um, I know well, definitely I've double standard. Said, it definitely puts their responsibility on the wrong person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I, I totally agree and i i think uh you know that's where a lot of those kinds of dress codes come but i think you know we're going to talk about like so-called professional dress codes too and i think that that school dress code way of thinking carries over into professional life yeah in a really uncomfortable way mm -hmm. So we have some more just like random dress code rules that we were brainstorming. I see that Maggie, you added hats to this list and I'm really glad that you did that because as a common, a frequent hat wearer, uh, I have a lot of concerns about where I can and cannot wear hats. <laughs> like my school wouldn't allow wearing hats and yet I would do it anyway because I was like, whatever. I'm a rule breaker. I'm a person who wears a hat at school. And <laughs> I like I would get yelled at for it, you know, like threatened. <laughs> I was gonna get in trouble for wearing a hat. I don't understand like I mean I've I've heard, you know, from teachers, from people in schools or even like workplaces, like there's an etiquette, quote unquote, you know, and like wearing a hat inside is a sign of disrespect. Like, not if it's a cool fucking hat and I'm showing up for you as my best and, like, that's part of the uh, scenario. Like, Yeah, it's called fashion. Look it up, okay? Yeah. That's I how just, I felt about it. I was I don't always understand. wearing a good hat, you know, and it was part of the look. It wasn't because I was like, I don't respect school. Exactly. <laughs> and it, it may not have, like, a, a practical purpose either. Like, if you're inside, I get it. You're not, like, shading your face from the sun or, like, protecting yourself from weather, but... 
yeah, it's it's a vibe. It's part of part of the thing. You're looking I don't, good. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems so arbitrary to me. Yeah, that's one. I like. I remember the two, the only two rules I ever broke in school, but I broke them repeatedly. Were wearing a hat and chewing gum. Mm-hmm. And at least the chewing gum, I'm like, well, people do put gum in gross places or you could be like running and choke. Fine. <laughs> but I felt like all I did all day at school was plot with my friends how to chew gum and not get caught while also wearing a hat. <laughs> that sounds like the title of your memoir, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. My priorities. I specifically like I remember like I, my my best friend, Laura Curley, always had the jumbo pack of like the extra sugarless gum. Ooh. And it would be like, how do we like, tra- how do you get a piece of gum to me without anyone knowing? And then like <laughs> put it in your mouth and not chew it at all so you don't get caught. Like, this is what, you know, clearly I wasn't being like challenged enough in school or something. I don't know. <laughs> you could have been doing drugs, okay? That's true. But instead of just chewing gum and wearing hats. And it was sugarless gum, just to reiterate. Um... So another one is like hoodies. And this is one where I feel like this is like so transparently yeah. based in racism and classism that I just, I mean, especially racism that I just can't even abide by it. But I will see this often. Like, you know, my day job, we have a lot of stores and malls and stores and malls have become more aggressive about posting dress codes like on the front doors Mm -hmm. um and it's really designed to keep people of color and teenagers out that's that's my opinion and uh hoodies are often on the list which i am just like it's such a ubiquitous article of clothing especially who doesn't have a hoodie yeah i know Mm -hmm. i know um trench coats we cited earlier but i mean i think this is like sort of a dated reference but i think it's a good one to call out that you know in the aughts it was like kids who wore trench coats to school. And we're not talking like khaki inspector gadget. We're talking like black, right? Would be targeted by teachers, by principals as potential like bad kids, kids who were going to engage in violence because, you know, there was like one school shooting. I think, was it Columbine where it was the the trench coat mafia? I'm not really sure. It might have been an earlier school shooting, but there was this sudden belief that kids who wear black trench coats to school are probably going to engage in violence. So this is what really gets me. Like, that's a really superficial assessment. Like, if you're looking at the full student body population, like, who's got the trench coats? Who's got the hats and black lipstick? But, like, where is the, the resources and support for, like, actually evaluating these kids to figure out, like, who might might be that person who you know at some point turns into the kid with a weapon or whatever like you you cannot judge a book by its cover i know that's a cliche Mm -hmm. but like the trench coat is not the deciding factor that is not like no you know i don't know i mean doesn't make sense I did just like verify it was Columbine that that was okay. associated with, and that's where yeah. it kind of grew from. But I mean, boys have been wearing black trench coats to high school for as long as black trench coats have existed because it's like <laughs> a certain type. I don't know. There's like these high school archetypes, right? And like, if you were really into, you know, anime or, you know, metal or goth music or electronics. Dungeons or and Dragons. S- Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> exactly. You would be wearing a black trench coat. Like, I grew up with, with, and specifically, it was like a thing that boys did, right? It was like, it was just, uh, it was an aesthetic. I don't know. I don't know how it happens before the internet, but somehow all the kids who were into Dungeons and Dragons knew <laughs> somehow it was just like programmed into their DNA that they needed a black trench coat. I don't know what it was, but they just all did, right? Because I went to several schools and it was the same at all of them. Um, But like that was one where kids would be targeted, pulled out of class, subject to disciplinary action. But like you said, Maggie, never like counseling. Although I don't know if wearing a trench coat makes you in need of counseling, right? Exactly. Uh, You know, it's just like you're trying to be cool. We're all just trying to be cool in high school. Um, Another one is backpacks. And I think this one... I mean, depending on where you see it, especially in schools, it's really like safety is the thought is, you know, the motivation there. So when my child Dylan was in high school, they were not allowed to bring backpacks to school. And this just like blew my mind because I was like, how do you how do you carry your stuff around? And and Dylan was like, well, you just only can carry a little bit at a time. And I was like, well, what about like tampons? 
What about personal things you don't want people to see? You know, little things. Like, it, it, it just was so shocking to me that we basically were taking away kids' autonomy and privacy but not allowing them to have mm-hmm. bags. But the implication is that they might have weapons in there. Um, it feels really, to me, it feels, I don't know, like kind of a violation of privacy, I guess. Um, you know, in other places like malls, stores, backpacks might not be allowed because, you know, it's ostensibly like a theft issue, which is also, you know, weird. Um, but I, I get it, I guess. But there is a lot of push pushback against using backpacks at this point because it's associated with like violence or mm-hmm. criminal activity or just I don't know, being up to something nefarious. And at the same time, like, I don't know about either of you, but at my school, it was really uncool to use both straps on your backpack. You had to always carry with one. And I swear, <laughs> I still, like, I have had back problems since high school because of it. Oh, totally. Same. Right? Same. Right? Yeah. It was also very cool at my, I, maybe not high school, but, like, middle school, it was very cool to get the backpack that you could get embroidered with your initials. Oh, oh yeah. I don't know if it Very was like cool. Jansport or like Land's End or something, like one of those kind of like silent luxury or whatever. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Quiet right? luxury. I know. <laughs> and there was also like this weird pushback where I remember parents being like, Aren't you worried that like someone will like guess your kid's name and like entice oh. them to come to like their car or something? <laughs> like <laughs> like it was so strange. Like I remember I, I think I don't think I had one, but a friend of mine had one. And I, I just remember some parents talking and being like, well, aren't you worried that, like, you know, the backpack says E and, like, someone will just guess that it's, like, Emily and be like, Emily, like, your mom sent me to pick you up from school today. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's, like, wow. so weird. People, I feel like people really like to just, like, assume the worst. It's, like, a lot of this, like, very fear-mongering like with the backpacks thing too and like trench coats and everything it's like i know it's like I know. sure Hoodies, a backpack all was used a couple you know maybe a handful of times like i think like the boston marathon bombing comes to mind i think that was mm-hmm. a backpack um yeah. and that might have been like what kind of what set off like all of those restrictions on backpacks but yeah it's like oh, come on like one backpack I don't know. Maybe they'll use a tote bag next time. Like, does that mean we all have to I know, right? Bags? I mean, that's the thing. People who want to do bad things are just going to get a different vessel. That's right. right. They're not going to be right? like, oh, I can't bring a backpack to school. I guess I'll never do that crime. Like, yeah, no. I know. It's so silly. And I do think, like, I mean, a lot of these sorts of policies, I mean, they obviously come from, like, no one thinking anything through and just looking for, like, an easy solve Mm -hmm. that will make people feel better. But rather than addressing, you know, like, gun violence in schools, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, at an all-time high, right? Instead, it's like, we'll just take away backpacks and trench coats and hoodies. It's like, oh, and we won't let kids wear hats in school either. I don't know if that's still going on. But, like, it's like... No, like there are these larger issues here, but it's to make someone feel like something was done somewhere, but uh, not yeah. allowing backpacks doesn't make kids safer. Totally. Exactly. Um, you have a, you put a good one in here, Maggie, uh, that makes my skin crawl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I wish I had a source other than like lived experience and personal anecdotes mm-hmm. from clients, et cetera. But like it's another kind of if you know you know um in certain industries um especially for women and feminine presenting folks like pantyhose are a requirement oh. like it's not even you can't wear so pants gross. they may not say that explicitly but like there's the implication implied requirement of skirts and dresses in um industries especially like law comes to mind um you know, very, very specific footwear, including heels. I think we've got um, some insight from a listener maybe that talks about that a little bit. But like, it's mm-hmm. not just the high heels. It's got to be, you know, this very specific silhouette and the pantyhose to top it all off. No matter what I, time of year or uh, like. Yeah. So gross. And like, I don't know if any of you ever had to wear pantyhose at some point when you were kids, but... I remember I would have to wear pantyhose for orchestra concerts specifically. Oh, me too. And it would be so stressful for me yeah. to wear a pair of pantyhose. One, would I get a runner? Yes, I definitely would. <laughs> I played the cellos. So there were always snacks. Oh, no way. Me too, man. I, oh, what? <laughs> I what? Also played yeah, the cello you have in cello energy. Totally. <laughs> oh, wow. 
it's so um, funny. And, you know, then it's like, will they start falling down? Will they fit yeah. properly? They make you feel hot. And it mm-hmm. it does make me sad that, like, there, there still are people who are required to wear pantyhose every day. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was a teenager, my mom worked at a bank for a couple years. And definitely it was, like, pantyhose. And it specifically was, like, navy pantyhose. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just, I mean, I do wear tights in the winter uh, because, you know, I don't wear pants. That's my choice. But I do... Like, just the thought of wearing... First off, tights are more durable, right? They're easier to deal with. Pantyhose are so, like, semi-disposable, even though you know they're going to be in the landfill for centuries. Yeah. And to have to wear those in, like, the summer is nauseating to me, just thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do remember back when American Apparel was still in business, I had several friends who worked there in the store, and there was this sweeping dress code revision um, that didn't affect the uh, male employees at all. But anybody who who had like a feminine gender expression was immediately impacted because the rule was that everything on your body except for your shoes had to be from American Apparel. (gasps) And there was a clothing allowance. So like, okay, at least they got clothes for free. But, you know, the problem was like, okay, well, for you know, males working there, there there were pants, right? So, and you could wear a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, whatever, that was all there for you. But if you had a feminine gender expression, you were left with tights, basically, and hot pants. Mm. Um, and you weren't allowed to wear men's pants. Like, you had to wear oh. the the line that was appropriate to your gender, right? And so, all of my female friends who work there were like, yes, yeah, so now I have to wear like a bodysuit and tights to work. Congratulations to me. You know, oh. like sucks. Uh-huh. Right. And it was and it was a very conscious decision to make it like sexier there. You know, and Ooh. like that it's gro- it's gross. Uh, not glad, not sad that they're not around anymore. I mean, that is just like the tip of the iceberg that the stuff that was going on there. But it just felt so fundamentally unfair. And it really objectified the staff more than they already were. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Another dress code thing that, you know, I think I've, I don't know. I don't, I don't see as many signs for this now, but I feel like it's like a contract we've signed in society, which is no shirt, no shoes, no service. Right. I remember being on the door of like the convenience store near my grandma's house when I was a kid and I took it like really seriously. Because my brother would be like, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to take off my shoes and I'm going to run in. And I'd be like, no, we won't get service. They'll make us go home. <laughs> Grandma wants iced tea, you know? <laughs> and uh, I like was like, this is like one of the most important laws that anyone has ever passed, which I'm also pretty sure it's not a law. I have noticed more and more often that I do see people in convenience stores without shoes. Yeah. Um, or I every once in a while, someone without a shirt. It seems like they've relaxed on it, but maybe I've just relaxed on it. I don't know. <laughs> but it does, like, the shoes thing feels like a safety issue. Like, yeah, you I get know, that. Yeah. If they step yeah, on I get something that. and yeah. injure themselves. Um, someone added this one in here, uh, which I remember reading, uh, no cornrows except in February as cited by this Atlantic article. Yeah, it came from, uh, I can't remember if it was an elementary or middle school, but like literally a line from their school dress code policy. Um, and I was trying to figure this out. Like what is the connection of February? It's black history month. Right. And I, <sighs> I already already know that this conversation is going in the direction of we're going to like dismantle professionalism. We're going to talk about all the ways in which that plays out in the workplace. But yeah, I was like that, that is, I mean, outright overt racism in writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's disgusting. Um, it, It seems like something that would happen here in Texas, to be honest. It was was probably like Florida. (laughs) <laughs> maybe alabama yeah that's that's like a really mortifying one and then you know there are these like implied dress codes that we were talking about and i think uh maggie added this in here <laughs> but i think this is one like i mean i already touched on it when i talked about the navy pantyhose yeah which are the so-called like professional colors yeah right and yellow's not one of them right <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely not. Neither is red, even though we see like red as a power color in leadership and politics right. and like yeah. on the news and things like that. Red is definitely not part of what might constitute professional colors. Um, so the the anecdote that comes to mind specifically here is like I'm I'm working with a non binary client right now and we were talking about colors and prints and textures and just trying to get a read for what they like and don't like. So this is like early stage conversation. And they came up with this phrase that I thought was super on point um, in reference to what we see in like, you know, suit stores and suit separates and business casual retail environments. It's like you got black, you've got gray and navy and like they're all interchangeable uh. But it's basically those three colors. You might see a brown or like a tan khaki situation, but um, it's typically black, gray, and navy. And my my MB client referred to this as the compulsory masculine trio. Uh, <laughs> and in, in context, they're like, these, these do not appeal to me, right? So like anything in this trio generally is not going to resonate so it was like it was a powerful insight from them personally but i just thought like can we adopt that phrase because it really is it's totally compulsory like who decided that only those colors were quote unquote appropriate for like suiting you know and what if you did wear a red skirt suit to a legal proceeding what would happen you know I just think of those colors and I think of like that working woman archetype. There were so many movies that I felt like my mom rented on VHS that were about like working women who couldn't have it all but wanted to. And they were always wearing like just those colors in like suits. It makes me think of Kathy, you know? Oh, yes. (laughs) Very, very very Kathy. Um, But we still see that, you know, when my mom was working at the bank, like they were only allowed to wear navy. Wow, And she said that was because, you know, like Navy equals like having faith in the safety of your money. Mm. Yeah. Trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Weird. I also wonder if maybe like those neutral colors, if there's maybe a practical component to it as well, like black, gray and Navy. It's like maybe you can have fewer suits and like Mm -hmm. people won't notice that you're wearing the same suit like twice in a week maybe like if it's like a very neutral color because I sort of feel like if you have a bright red suit or like a bright yellow suit it's like that's pretty like noteworthy like people will notice Mm -hmm. and so you probably have to have a lot um more garments to cycle through like that was actually something that was kind of interesting um in the the book that I was reading they talked about like news anchors um and Mm -hmm. a couple different um like, I guess, lawsuits over dress codes for news anchors. And uh, I guess several women that work in that industry um, basically, like, sued, I think it was KNBC or something, for making them have, like, these adhere to these way stricter dress codes than their male counterparts. Like, their male counterparts could wear the same suit twice in a week, um, Mm -hmm. whereas they were expected to have enough outfits that they would only repeat an outfit, I think it was, like, once every three or four weeks. Oh, wow. um, Which is crazy. <laughs> like if you think that's about expensive. just like totally expensive right like and that's they buy their own clothes like news anchors are not costumed you know like that is mm-hmm. wow see that's yeah. like shocking to me too because it's it's like their work uniform it should be provided mm-hmm. right and it's expected to be very nice too like they're you know they're expected to have very like nice tailored stuff that's so weird have either of you ever watched better call saul No, I haven't. Okay, well, it's about a lawyer, and he's like, you know, he's a schemer and a scammer. It's a guy who was also on Breaking Bad. I'm doing a terrible job of describing the show, but he's a lawyer, right? And so he Mm -hmm. goes into court, and all the lawyers are wearing, like, lawyer suits in, like— black navy gray and he he shows up in like purple suits <laughs> and green suits and red suits and it's really supposed to demonstrate how he is just like a wild card you yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> know <laughs> he's not like other lawyers. I mean, I just gave the worst description of that show ever, and I actually highly recommend it. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just like one of those subtle ways 
Now I'm sending like one of these people on the succession Reddit who's like, it's a quiet luxury. But this is like another way in which, you know, the costuming really signals who this person is. And we're supposed to be like, oh, he's a real character. Oh, I bet he has lots of unorthodox ways of defending his clients, you know? If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at wear underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. 
tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Do you want to talk about some contemporary examples of dress codes? Yeah. So in preparation for this, I was thinking like, how cool might it be just to see how, well, number one, like how does the language sort of evolve over time? What kind of things are we seeing in terms of changes from today versus like (laughs) the 1300s? Like Ruby was telling us about (laughs) like, what's the same, what's different. And I just did like a, a really small sort of random sample. Um, the first one is actually from an elementary school, excuse me, a middle school in central Washington state. I think geography like regionality probably plays some role, um, in a lot of these dress code policies, but like this one in particular, I would say is one of the least stringent and specific in terms of the language that they use, which I thought was interesting. Um, There's another example from, I think it's an elementary school, maybe in Alabama. So again, keeping like geography and regionality in mind, there are definitely some differences, but um, leading into kind of more about specific language that we see in the history of dress codes, like there are still words that keep popping up that would have popped up probably as early as the 1300s. Not that, you know, like formal dress codes were necessarily established then like we know them today, but like well-groomed, um, neat, appropriate, like what a subjective Ugh. term. I, I know we'll get, word. yeah, I yeah. know we'll get more into that. Um, it references safety. You know, they, they want students to dress in a safe manner. Um, this specific one, again, from a middle school in Washington state, uh, specifies that students may express individuality in their dress and grooming. If their appearance does not cause a disruptive influence either to themselves or others while in the pursuit of an education <laughs> and their appearance does not present a health and safety problem, which is Interesting. I know we're going to talk about hygiene a little bit later. Um, this idea of like disruption, you know, we've talked about the dynamic um, and the expectation that like feminine presenting students shoulder the responsibility of this quote unquote disruption, you know, like a bra strap is to blame versus like dudes don't know how to effectively express their feelings and like, you know, (laughs) channel them in more productive ways, I guess. But yeah. um, Let me see. So this, okay. I've got an elementary school in Colorado. It gets a little more stringent and specific. And some of the language in this specific dress code policy is like some of the same shit we probably saw in the late nineties and early two thousands. Like, especially around like the length of shorts, uh, which can't mm-hmm. be standardized by the way. It can't be like an, you know, an X inch inseam across the board. It's relative to the student. Like um, where, where does the, the hem fall relative to like their fingertips on the side of their thigh? Like, which, you know, it, 
I mean, this we're going to talk about this a little bit later, too, because a listener did share some thoughts on this. But that kind of thing, it really penalizes students who are outgrowing their clothes too fast, who yeah. just had a growth spurt, whose parents can't afford new clothing. Um, it's really frustrating. You know, I mean, even just the like, if your parents say, hey, we're going to buy all your clothes like one size too big because you're growing and now your shirt's falling off your shoulder and your bra straps hanging out. That's mm-hmm. like another thing that you could get in trouble for. It's just so I mean, it, it it punishes people who are already having enough problems. Yeah, that so something else I want to point out, and I know we're we're going to talk more in detail about like probably discrimination and um, how dress codes manifest and what the consequences are in the workplace. But like pretty much every resource that I found that was like a documented policy or some um, like, I don't know, thought leadership authority saying like, this is how it's done is presented in a, a binary gendered fashion Mm -hmm. period it's like yeah there's men and women and that's it and there are conventions for men and there are conventions for women and that's it no deviation Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. um again like back to the specific language as as long as dress codes have existed i think we'll see some version of like the following phrases so we mentioned appropriate um, modesty, mm-hmm. which I know is something that Ruby brought up. Like, there's a lot of um, moral value attached mm-hmm. to that concept, for better or worse. Disruptive, um, distracting are oh, that's those words. A, that's one, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. and I, I mean, seriously, almost every resource, every policy that I could pull up had some variation of these words. Proper was another one, which may or may not be closely tied to modesty, um, certainly signifies like um, an air of classism. I mean, it reeks of that, I think. Who determines what's proper? Um, so yeah, heavily gendered, of course. Uh, these are almost always binary, even the contemporary examples. We see a lot of references to clean and neat, um, specifically around hygiene what is clean? What is neat? That's what I want to know. Like these, these are, are all so kind of subjective. subjective. Yeah. yeah. Like you can't measure any of these. Exactly. Um, yeah. That concept of modesty, gosh, it, I mean, it comes up a lot. Um, and when I think about that, it's just, it, it reeks of a few things. Like I immediately think like white male in power, like, who, who mm-hmm. decides what is modest, what's appropriate. Um, so I put in my notes here, like, w- it's very waspy, like, heteronormative, <laughs> patriarchal. Mm-hmm. There's an undertone that sex, pleasure, any kind of, like, um, I don't know, like, visible relationship with your body, pride, vanity, anything like that is bad. There's, like, some objectional, objectionable, like, moral failing or something attached to it um conformity i don't know like i know amanda you mentioned the word uniformity earlier i don't know if we talked about conformity specifically uh, we might not necessarily see that word written in policy but that is absolutely the subtext the undertone mm-hmm. we want we want everybody mm-hmm. to look the same um you know with except the the double standards among gender expressions, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So uniformity comes up. Conformity is kind of the undertone. Discipline also shows up a lot as Mm -hmm. if what you wear, again, like we were talking about the trench coats, what you wear is any indication of like what you're capable of um, Mm -hmm. or maybe what you don't wear, you know, Mm -hmm. says something specific about you. Uh, which reads to me as just like the opposite of individualism, you know, conformity is ex- 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 exactly that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Can I yeah. add something about discipline, Maggie? 
Oh, please. Yes. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it was interesting. Um, when I was reading this book before, they were talking a little bit about kind of the uh, differentiated gender roles and kind of like gender norms um, in the mid 20th century and how that plays out in dress codes and like this all of these like etiquette books um, that people would buy and read to try to figure out like these kind of the unspoken dress codes, um, you know, the stuff where you're like, I know I'm doing this wrong, but I'm not sure how, or like, right. I feel like I don't yeah. fit in, but I'm not sure how. And there was this one etiquette book. Um, I'll have to look it up later. I can't remember the title of it, but they, they quote the quote from it, like stuck out in my mind so much. Um, it's super rude, but the quote was, there are no ugly women, only lazy ones. <gasps> Whoa! <laughs> with the implication being that like it is on you to like put in like so much time and energy and effort to like make yourself look like this essentially this like conformist <sighs> ideal of beauty um and it's on you as a personal failing if you do not meet that standard oh um, my god yeah so when you say discipline like it makes me it makes me think about that right like this idea that like we have to that like yeah like you have to take responsibility for your appearance and that if you're not meeting someone else's standard it's that you're not trying hard enough yeah but conversely especially in more professional environments which we're going to get into there is this expectation that you shouldn't be too beautiful right <laughs> no uh, i was listening to a podcast this weekend that was actually about the music industry and had nothing to do with what we're talking about right now but they started talking about how in the 80s uh like you know even in the record industry as like an executive or working in the office um as a woman uh there was this expectation that like hey if you want to get promoted you need to cut off your hair Mm -hmm. You need to wear really boring, so-called modest clothing, uh, or no one's going to take you seriously as a capable member of the team. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep your hair long or you wear, like, feminine blouses, uh, no one's going to think you can do your <laughs> job. And so it kind of led to this, like, getting the, like, sensible bob as, like, mm -hmm. part of the unwritten part of the dress code for a lot of office environments. And I think that's that's really interesting to think about, too. And it's something that, you know, I think about every day when I, you know, I work in an office um, where people it's like kind of like a business casual environment, but like it's very traditional. I mean, this is Texas. Right. And I come in wearing like loud colors and puff sleeves and I have like waist length hair and I have definitely felt people talking down to me. Mm -hmm. As if I am inexperienced or unknowledgeable in what I do. And I actually said at one point, you know, in a meeting, like, I know that you feel like I'm incompetent because you're looking at me. But if you just listen to me, <laughs> you would realize that I am <laughs> very competent. And everybody's like, oh, no, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you might be on something a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Right. I can read the room. <laughs> but I do think like, you know especially with a lot of the people I work with, you know, I'm a non-binary person. That's something that like makes their, they can't, does not compute. Right. So in their eyes, I'm a lady, right. Mm. I'm coming in there as a lady to do business and looking like that. How could I possibly be good at like, I don't know, retail mm. math. And I do think like, you know, maybe we don't all have to go out and get a sensitive Bob now, or whatever. <laughs> but there is still that implication there. Yeah. I think I think also like um like yeah thanks for sharing that Amanda I think I think there's like a anybody who exists in any sort of like marginalized identity whether it be like due to gender due to race due to class it's like there is almost this expectation that in order to succeed in a professional environment you need to like emulate the aesthetic of those in power yeah um, definitely whether definitely. that means like yeah dressing in a more masculine fashion or like in a more traditionally masculine fashion or like yeah almost like minimizing anything that might set you apart from the people mm -hmm, that you're trying mm -hmm. to get in with um, yeah, definitely. I mean, there are uniforms, these unspoken uniforms that people wear to fit in to uh, get professional respect. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of that, you know, even, you know, for me, like I, I don't shave my armpits. I have hairy armpits, which I don't think about at all. It's like, yeah, so do like half my friends, my husband does, who cares, right? Um, but I, when I first started at my job, I was wearing a sleeveless dress. 
and I stretched and people saw Mm. my hairy armpits and there were a bunch of people like staring and making faces Mm. and like pointing and whispering to each other. And so now no matter how hot it is, I have to wear something with sleeves. Now, no one said that I have to wear something with sleeves. That's not in the handbook or anything, Yeah. but I feel that pressure so Mm -hmm. that people aren't distracted by my armpit hair and will listen to what I have to say. And I think that's like, I mean, that's like a minor issue in a much more challenging world, right? But I think that there are these smaller ways in which many of us are being policed in terms of how we dress, how we express ourselves, how we groom ourselves that we might not even be aware of. Totally. Because we just want people to listen to us. You know, we want to be taken seriously. We want to be treated with respect or at the very least not not called out. Yep. You know, yeah. not attract any attention. And I think like a lot of that really starts with when we're kids, the policies around dress codes in school. Yeah, I'm thinking about like just the concept of like respectability politics and how that plays out with like so many different like marginalized groups and yeah, like this simultaneously, like wanting to be accepted by the dominant culture, feeling like you need to be accepted by the dominant culture in order to like, Mm -hmm. have any sort of power or any sort of say over things while also feeling like you're having to like give up a part of yourself to, to do that, right? Like you're having to conform. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Yeah, there there was a really interesting anecdote. Um, in the book I read about the dress code at Morehouse College. um, And they were talking about how like a lot of like equivalent Ivy League schools like do not have dress codes, um, Mm. but how there's so many wealthy people at those schools. Like I think the the author of this book works and maybe is an alumni of Stanford. um, And he was saying how there's just so many wealthy people there that like they kind of understand how to dress for a job interview or how to like Uh. exist, you know, in these professional spaces. Um, And for a school like Morehouse, that is so like one of their, you know, main um, values is to provide some like upward mobility for their students. It's like actually a really important part of the culture to like teach people how to dress in that way. Mm. So it's very uncomfortable for a lot of the students coming into that environment to like Mm -hmm. you know, kind of understand, like, that dress code and, like, why it exists. And I guess there have been a lot of controversies, like, in recent years over, like, what that dress code entails, um, especially for, like, some LGBTQ students at Morehouse. Um, But it was just, yeah, it was just really interesting to think about, like, how dress codes, they can be really harmful, but there's also kind of this benefit of, like, sometimes it helps you, it can help you to, like, fit into you know, a situation or like a professional environment where you might otherwise not be taken seriously. But if you can dress the part, people will take you seriously. Um, before, yeah, before they even know, like, oh, this is a really smart person. Like, yeah, he had a, he had a funny line about how it's like, you might have like this encyclopedic memory and be like a super brilliant person, but people can't like read that just from like glancing at you, but they can read that you like put on the right suit. Interesting. I mean, that is so true, though, right? Based on, you know, the judgments. I mean, when people talk about clothes being sort of like frivolous, uh, I would I would say, you know, we we do judge books by covers, (laughs) literally books, but also people and how they're dressed. And we all have a lot to unpack there. There's no one listening to this who doesn't. Right. And a lot of this has been programmed in in different ways, sort of like silently telegraphed to us via dress codes via things we've heard people say via behaviors that we're emulating because like the adults around us did it when we were kids, you know, where we pick it up from media and we definitely make judgments on whether or not we're going to take someone seriously or respect them or like what their lives are like based on what they're wearing. And I think it's like something that we all need to like just fully admit (laughs) and work on. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's just as insidious. Thank you to Ruby and Maggie for spending almost three hours with me last week. And thank you in advance to both of them for spending more time with me tomorrow night. If you aren't following them both on Instagram yet, well, what? Just get on it, okay? <laughs> I'll share all of their contact info in the show notes. You should go check out all the other stuff that they're working on. They will be back with me next week where we will be tackling the loaded term 
professionalism, along with the social constructs that lie beneath both corporate and school dress codes. And we will be sharing your thoughts and stories. So if you have any thoughts about what we discussed in this week's episode, send them my way via email to amanda at closehorse.world. That's all for this week's episode. I know I usually give you some like words of wisdom or a pep talk or something at the end of every episode, but as you know, it's very hot. The air conditioning is not happening right now so that I can do this. So it's time. The sweat is literally getting into my contacts right now. So I'm going to call this the end of this episode until next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of Close Horse, written, researched, edited, unair conditioned by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating, maybe even a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, but most importantly, tell your friends. Like, really, Close Horse exists because people tell other people who tell other people, and that's really cool. <laughs> If you'd like to support my work financially, which I would greatly appreciate, you can learn more at patreon.com slash close horse podcast, or you can check out other options in the link of my profile on Instagram. Thanks as always to my other half, Dustin Travis White for music, audio support, and just generally not getting sad when I turn off the AC. All right. See y'all next week. Bye. Bye.